What do you know about Michigan and what are you interested in learning more about? Sure. So, I mean, I think the point I was trying to make is that at the federal level, um, we see on a regular basis the basic data that about children entering and exiting care in foster care in every state. And so um, we're able to take a close look at each state and say, um, basically, are they making progress or aren't they making progress? And then um, a trip like this gives us a chance to really see um, in a real world sense um, the progress that states are making. And just looking at the data itself, it looks like uh, Michigan is moving in the right direction. Um, it looks like it's overcome. Uh, a number of challenges, but the data looks pretty good here in Michigan. I think one of the interesting challenges that, they, that Michigan has relates to older youth, um, but my sense is that um, they're working to get their arms around that issue, and so I think it's a state that is uh, moving in the right direction, and um, folks ought to be pretty positive about um, the direction Michigan's headed. So you, you mentioned kind of uh, older youth, transition age youth, um, and so, so you said they're trying to get their arms, or what, 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 to what degree do you kind of, do you have a vision of what the issues may be, and then what, what do you see as some mitigating factors, and what are you looking for? To sure, um, you know, I, I don't know enough, um, and that's, that's part of what I, I will hope to learn um, here today. Um, uh, it appears that uh, Mi Michigan, particularly for older youth, um, are using um, congregate living arrangements to um, provide support to them. So there are more young people in group homes um, than in some other states. Um, and again, um, th there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. Um, there may be an explicit strategy around that, and I just don't have the benefit of knowing that. Um, but it's one of the trends that catches the eye as you, as you look at their data. Um, and again, interpretation uh, um, is difficult to make uh, unless you're on the ground talking to real people. And that's the benefit of having an event like this is you get a chance to interact with real people, with state officials and others, and it really brings that data to life. You can appreciate the extent to which there's a strategy behind the data or not. Um, and so that's certainly what I'm hoping to learn more about today. Um, well, we've seen in kind of lightning speed how uh, conversations in Miami turned into legislation on the federal level, um, be directly because of this listening tour. So, as a you know, you're on a little bit of a different track than elected officials, right? That's so, right. So, um, as commissioner, what can you know? What can, what kind of substantive change can you take away from? from what, what's your power? Sure. Out of this? Sure. So yeah, I mean, so I, I certainly look at, at this opportunity um, different than an elected official um, uh, would. Um, but but um, I think in the end, uh, I think this is really valuable for two reasons. Um, certainly, one is that the 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 position I'm in, um, we can provide help to states, and so we have technical assistance resources that exist um, at a national level that states can take advantage of. And so, if I see opportunities here for the federal government to support state government in getting its arms around issues or building capacity, um, that's something that I can do immediately. Um, and in the longer term, we can work with the state um, to build capacity where they think they need to. So beyond just technical assistance resources, we can look at the other discretionary grant making we do or the waiver um, authority we have to really help states make big changes. And so, you know, again, Michigan's moving in the right direction. Um, we're here to offer help if we can, um, but I'm not going to judge what that looks like until I get a chance to hear um, what folks uh, talk about here on the ground. So it, it's, it's a pretty cool um, opportunity. Um, so I'm going to finish with two questions Go real for quickly. It. Um, so, I mean, you know, I think we, we, you and I had talked way back when in, uh, in Maryland, right before we started talking about you know, yeah. this whole conversation about education and foster care. So, you know, that's been a big theme. We're going to hear about it more today. So kind of, you know, from your perspective, what in what are the most exciting developments? What 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 is it telling you about the way the field's moving mm -hmm. with all this recent kind of excitement around the education issues? You know, I th I think what folks have come to understand um, is that um, uh, abuse and neglect has a profound effect on a child's life, um, and in those circumstances, simply removing a child from a bad situation 
is a step in the right direction, but it's not all of what a young person needs. And so really what's exciting about what's happening in child welfare today is people are really beginning to look at the well-being issues. They're looking at what are the kinds of experiences young people need in order to succeed. So rather than just rescuing them from a bad situation, folks are now talking about how do they springboard them into a positive life trajectory. And that's one of the critical roles that education can play. Um, a child who receives a complete and competent um, education has the capacity to control their life in a way um, that if they're not well educated, they don't. You know, historically, um, only about 50% of children in foster care graduate from high school. Um, so clearly we've got to get better at that. Um, but we see education as one of those fundamental um, um, services to getting to better outcomes for kids in foster care.